So welcome back to our uh, uh, special guest uh, section of the show. I am very, very happy. I am right now here in Amsterdam and uh, I am with a living legend of marketing and his name is uh, Rich Sheffern. He is the uh, uh, CEO and uh, owner of Strategic Profits. If you have never heard of Strategic Profits, I think you better check it out because I can tell you it's going to change your business uh, in many ways and uh, I think you are going to really enjoy what we're going to be talking with Rich. So Rich, welcome to the show. Thank you, thank you for having me. And it's an welcome. absolute pleasure to have you first of all here in Amsterdam. Uh, what thanks. have you thought of Amsterdam so far? Oh, it's been a, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, I spoke a couple of days ago and the audience was a great audience. Uh, lots of business people like really uh, determined to grow their business and, uh, and taking the steps to do that. So it was, it was fun to be in that kind of energy. Fantastic. Uh, what? Uh, let me just uh, go straight into some of the uh, questions. And okay. I mean, I love the name of your company, Strategic Profits. But now, see, my most of my audience is basically on the Middle East, and uh, one of the big problems that I find in the Middle East is that they're not strategic at all. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah. can you break it down in uh, uh, simple terms? What strategy? What strategy? What's stra sure. Okay. So, um, the part. Of, well, part of the equation is is that a lot of people kind of distinguish between strategy versus tactics, mm -hmm. right? And that's not really, that's not the best distinction that there can be um, because tactics are really what support a strategy. So really, if you're going to compare strat being strategic to something else, um, it would be being strategic versus being opportunistic. In other words, when you're strategic, you have a long-term game plan that you're trying to get to. You have a vision, you have an outcome that you're trying to do, and now it's about what are the least number of steps, what are the least amount of resources that I can use to get that outcome. Whereas when you're opportunistic, any opportunity to make money has potential to be something that you might do, and the challenge is, is that while there might be an opportunity there, it might not be the opportunity that actually takes you to the end goal that you really want. So you can be strategic and, and see certain opportunities, but those opportunities have to be the ones that help you get to that outcome. Whereas when you're just opportunistic, you're just kind of looking around and, oh, that looks like a good idea, that looks like a good idea, that looks like a good idea, and your criteria is, can I make money with it, right? So, so what ends up happening is, is that the company that's strategic gets further, faster, because they're only taking those opportunities that get them to their outcome, whereas someone who's being opportunistic generally bounces around from one thing to another and really never gets that breakthrough to get their business to a point where it can actually be stronger, more powerful, and can really gain the momentum that they need. So at the end of the day, it, it's really about what is essential versus what's not essential to make my business exactly the way I want it versus what can I do today, right? Exactly. And, and, and that's the difference. Yeah, that sounds uh, uh, very similar to what is happening right now there in, uh, in Dubai and other places in the Middle East. What happens is that there's a lot of opportunity you're right. exactly yeah. as, you're, uh, as you're saying. So how would you define the difference between uh, an opportunity seeker and a strategic entrepreneur? Um, well, the strategic entrepreneur knows exactly what the business is that they're trying to create. And that might change over time because based on feedback from the market, but there's consistently moving towards turning that, that vision into a reality. And because of that, it can kind of cascade down so that you know, like, this is essential, this is non-essential. And they've made certain decisions that of what they're going to do, what they're not going to do. You know, so a very famous author about strategy once said, until you know what customers you're never going to serve, until you know what products you're never going to create, until you know all the things that you're not going to do, you don't really have a strategy because a strategy really at the end of the day is making tough decisions about what's the best use of my resources, yeah. right? There's no thought process like that going on with an opportunity seeker, right? What's the best use of my resources? It's just, oh, that looks good, that looks good, that looks good, and then they get spread out, scattered too thin, and they don't make progress. Exactly. You, uh, you're considered the uh, guru of gurus in the internet, and um, you have changed the business of thousands of people. What would be your advice for uh, somebody which is actually just getting started with their own online business? Sure. So, um, well, the first thing that people have to realize is that the internet's kind of changed some of the rules of the game of business. So, the first big change that the internet has caused is a shift from proximity to relevancy. So, consumers used to decide who to buy from based on how close people were to them, right, to a large extent. 
because they really didn't have any other options. What the internet does, because it brings a worldwide source to your, you know, to your doorstep, so to speak. Um, now people make the choice of who's most relevant to me, not who's closest to me. So you have to like target a market. You have to know who you're going after, and then once you know who you're going after specifically, what group, um, then how can you be more relevant to them than anyone else? A better solution, your marketing speaks to them, and so on. So the very first thing to understand about the online environment is, is that it's different than the offline environment. Yeah. And it's different in the sense that you get to put your best foot forward to a global audience, something that you know, even the biggest companies in the world couldn't do 20 years ago. But with that also comes competition from all over the world. Yeah. And so the only way that you really can stand out and build a business is to figure out that group that you're going after. The good news is, is that group can be spread out all throughout the world, yeah. but some group that you're the best choice for. Yeah. And if you do that, so many of the other steps of growing your business become so much easier because you're already talking to a group where you are the most relevant to, you are the best solution for. And so it really, it's those beginning steps, those decisions that have huge impact later on. And you can shift over time, but it's who do you serve and why are you the best choice for them? Exactly. Right now, um, I mean, you have been. Fo I mean, you have focused a lot, of course, in the in the small business owners. Right. But also, I mean, these kind of principles also ap apply to the to the bigger business sure. uh, businesses. And uh, one of the things that I keep on seeing is that right now, at this point, the the bigger businesses are the ones which are struggling. So, what would be your your advice for a struggling business? It does. I mean, uh, somebody which is treading water on the online uh, environment doesn't matter the size. Okay. Well, I, you know, what I would say is is that um, it really depends on what's being offered. But um, obviously, whatever you're selling, whether it's a product, a service, what have you, um, you should have a reason why people should be buying it from you, right? And in marketing speak, we call that the USP. Yeah. And so you have this USP, you have this, you have this reason why people should be buying your product. The, the marketing, which is you know using social media, search engines, pay-per-click, Facebook, whatever, right, YouTube, um, your goal in all of those things should be to help reinforce a single thought, a belief, uh, a concept that supports that USP. So, in other words, you know, if you have the widest selection of whatever, yeah. right, then all your marketing should point to why having a wider selection is so vital. Yeah. And that it should be the convincing point that when someone gets through some of your marketing, they're like, I must buy from a place that has the widest selection. And then when they find your, when they come to your place that has the widest selection, it works. If you have the, the narrowest selection, because you've taken it down to the few that are the best of whatever it is you sell, then your marketing would be all about how you want someone else to whittle it down so that the choice you make is an easy choice to make and you know from only a few. So your marketing really is there to serve the business by reinforcing certain beliefs, certain ideas that if the prospect latches onto or the marketplace latches onto, they see the need for your product. And most most of the people I see out there that are doing marketing online don't really get that. And because of that, they're you know different messages all over the place. And the problem with that is is that prospects, people online in general are scattered. And so you can't you can't hit them with a different message each day and expect that they're going to remember all those messages. So you have to have this one core idea that really supports why people should buy your USP. And then that needs to be spread out through all of your marketing channels, whether it's you know social media or not. Um, and once that's done, then you can really start building on it. Uh, and you can take it much further. But that's really the essence yeah. of uh, the beginning of the marketing process. And I know it's kind of a, it's a little off topic from what the question was, but I think that the, the the next evolution, once you have that kind of in place, is to really look at two numbers in your business, and those two numbers are the cost to acquire a customer and the, the lifetime value of a customer, yeah. um, because those are the two numbers that really will dictate your success. The lower the cost to acquire, the better. Uh, the more that you make per customer, the better. And ultimately, the way most markets shake out over time um, is that the, the company that has the highest lifetime value per customer wins. 
because they can spend the most to acquire, right? So those two numbers really are kind of like blood pressure and cholesterol, like for the human body. They don't tell you that you're going to die today, but they tell you what track you're on, right? So it's like if the if your cost per acquisition is going down and your lifetime value is going up, then you're, you've got a healthy business. If it's going the other way, then it's like you're getting a high cholesterol and a high blood pressure and there's going to be a problem down the road. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Fantastic, great. Well, um, one of the things that uh, I definitely recommend you guys to do is uh, go to strategicprofits.com and there you should download uh, Rich's reports. You have what, right now, about five of them? I think seven is total. Seven of them. Yeah, a new one coming out in a few months, actually, first one in years. Fantastic. I mean, uh, can you just tell us uh, uh, about a couple of your reports? Because I mean, I think they're just some of the in most incredible pieces of uh, marketing and information that I have ever read, so I definitely recommend you to go and download them. They're free, and uh, just possibly you can tell us about a couple of them. Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, I've written reports. Basically, my whole company was built on reports, and uh, the very first report I wrote was the Internet Business Manifesto, and that really pointed to what you know the one of the things you were asking me about earlier about the difference between opportunity seekers and strategic entrepreneurs and when I wrote that I was writing it to most internet marketers saying you know you guys are really opportunity seekers and this is why you're struggling and kind of laid out the case as to why um, the report after that was the missing chapter which came out like a couple weeks after because I realized that I would missed a piece in the manifesto that I took for granted that you should build your business around a core strength that you have, a passion that you have, and that I found that most people were actually in the wrong market based on the questions I was getting from the Internet Business Manifesto. Exactly. So I, I, I hurried that up. Um, the third report was the, um, was the final chapter, and that's where I took some of the secrets from a client of mine, uh, a company by the name of Agora Publishing, uh, that I was involved with and helped grow from 100 million to 600 million, wow. and how they did direct response marketing, which was different than most of the markets. So it was like, here's a company that gets it right. Here's how they do it. Learn from that. Um, after that series was done, then I wrote a series about attention. So I wrote the Attention Age Doctrine 1 and 2. And 1 was all about how do you get the most benefit out of your own attention. Uh, and number 2 was all about how do you get the attention of others and turn that into um, sales. So both of them were based on the concept that attention is quickly becoming the scarcest commodity online. You want to get the most from your own attention and you want to get the most of your prospects and clients' attention. So how do you do that? So those were those two reports. And then I wrote uh, the Maven Manifesto with Jay Abraham and that was all about how to be at the top of the market, how to be an authority, not only be an expert, but how do you market that expertise so that you're recognized as an expert. And then the last one I wrote was the Entrepreneurial Emergency, which was also called the Uncertainty Syndrome. And this was all about how, as the range of options have increased online, um, people became more and more overwhelmed and more and more uncertain about which path to take. And, you know, knowing as a small business, I can't do everything. And I'm only going to be able to do a few things, but if I'm only going to be able to do a few things, which ones should I really do? Because it seems like if I choose wrong, I'm screwed, you know, right out of the gate, exactly. right? So this was all about what really drives success and what do you need to be most focused on to grow your business. And, uh, and that was about really understanding what's constraining you right now and eliminating that. So that was the entrepreneurial emergency and that was really the last report I wrote and that was back in 2008. Um, and so five years later now, I'll probably be writing, well, not probably, I'm definitely writing a new report about what now is the next evolution. Wow, fantastic. Well, um, we, hope to have, we hope to see you soon in, uh, in, in the Middle East, in Dubai specifically, uh, Bahrain, Kuwait, uh, possibly even India. So it will be, uh, it will be interesting to have, you, uh, to have you there. It's been a pleasure having you on oh, the show. You.